Welcome. I'm Brad Perry, the Chief Executive Officer of Grey Produced SA. Uh, today we're going to be digging below the surface into soils, particularly soils in the mid-north. Why are we doing this? Well, as we know, sustainability underpins everything we do as a grain industry. And with that in mind, GBSA received a grant from the Northern and York Landscape Board through the Grassroots Grants Program. The shifting climate poses several hurdles for farmers and landholders, demanding adaption, impact reduction and enhanced resilience in both farming practices and business strategies. We hope this webinar will support grain producers and mixed farmers in the Northern New York region by equipping them with essential skills in soil data management, mapping and interpretation. Soil health assessment will be a key focus of today's webinar, as will moisture level analysis and strategies for minimising greenhouse gas emissions. We have a full agenda today, starting shortly with Michael Ayres from Field Systems, who will take us on a virtual crop walk and soil pit dig at the Heaslips family property at Appalachia. We'll then hear from research agronomist Sean Mason from Agronomy Solutions, who will give us a rundown on soil mapping techniques before Brian Hughes from Perza will take us through considerations for soil health. Ben Flay from Precision Ag will then take us through some SAGET funded research looking at subsurface uh, acidity in the mid-north, followed by Ollie Madgett from Farm Lab, who will talk about a project he's been working on with GPSA looking at soil carbon baselining. So an absolutely action-packed uh, agenda today. Uh, we'll save all questions until the final session. If you do have a question during each presentation, please make sure you pop it in the Q&A box below when you think of it. We'll collate all the questions and put them to our speakers later on. You won't have the opportunity to turn your mic on and ask the question live, so please make sure that you use the Q&A box, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And a reminder that we're after questions we can learn from, uh, not statements. We're now going to hear from Michael Ayres, who's going to take us on a virtual crop walk and soil pit dig at the Heaslips family uh, grain property at Apollo. Uh, I'm Michael Ayres from Field Systems. Uh, welcome to the next edition of In Appala, the virtual crop walk uh, hosted by Grains Producers SA and funded by the Northern York's Landscape Board. Here we are, uh, it's an Upper North Farming Systems trial site in uh, Heaslip's paddock. So it's Jim and James and Will Heaslip who are with me now today. Uh, Will kindly has gone out and got the, uh, not the backhoe, but the front end loader and made a considerable hole in the ground for us to have a look at the different layers. Uh, the issue here that the heat slips have picked up is that the cereal crop this year hasn't performed as well as it should have, but there's a mosaic and quite a distinct change in performance throughout the paddock, like a mottling. So this has always been a challenging property. Um, it was share farmed by a dairy farmer for a long time before Dad bought it. Um, there were some gypsum trials that were done in the early 60s but we didn't ever get any results from that. And the paddock's always performed well provided there's been moisture but when it's been tight it's, it's been tough. So um, we've just dug a bit of a soil pit here behind us to uh, see what kind of infiltration we've had with moisture and things like that and we've got some quite surprising results in the surface area has been a lot more acid than I expected it to be. Yeah, it was a little throttle yeah, in that Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll stand about that because we have tested in the past and it's always been neutral. So we always mix, I was only going here on yeah. two centimetre increments, yeah, but yeah, you can, right. there's a little... We've always done sample, mixed it up and yeah, yeah. had an average, so um, we've been able to look at the layers here. So um, we're now deciding how, how best to uh, ameliorate the problem. Yeah, because as you're saying before, Jim, the layers aren't linking and adding value to each other. I know it all looks like the same soil, it all looks the same, but it's kind of not talking to each other, and that's what you need to, which is why you get these acid problems and quite change the pH because there's different levels of activity, different chemistry that involved. We picked up very quickly that there was an acid throttle, very near surface acid, acid throttle running at yeah under five and a half ph just quickly having a look so uh in light of james he slips um indication that he wants to grow lentils there they would obviously get belted in relation to this site 
and I think it would vary across the paddock uh, substantially. So it's certainly a case in question of understanding surface pH, uh, which would be valuable and zoning that. That would affect lentils. Yeah, well that's probably why the lentils, that's at six the trial here, the lentils looked ordinary. Yep. Yeah, that's at six centimetres. So you're, you're back in, you're running a five, and you're back up to a six and a six there. And then you've got your alkaline soil at depth. So this is, this goes from um, uh, so top soil? Top soil like literally top soil. Uh, probably three centimetres down, and that's probably at about five. Just where the soil changed here. So it's about five to six centimetres there, which would affect your lentils. Okay. If you look at this slumping, that's not so sort of dispersion, there's not a lot of fine clay in there. Um, if you like, it's, so it's under confining pressure in the soil, it's not going to slump literally, but it, it is. And then so water will accumulate, hyper accumulate there. So at the top of that, with kind of more extraction, this would be prone to be. Uh, more the conditions would be more acidifying, so that's where you get these little narrow bands or these throttles of which can be a centimetre and a half wide, two centimetres wide. Here we're looking at soil dispersion and just very quickly looking at into a, a glass petri dish putting soil to do what's called a dispersion test. So when you you put um, demineralised water in to the petri dish, which we're doing here, and then we put small chunks or little peds of soil uh, into there to see what happens when they're actually wet up. So the topsoil usually has got some more organic matter, it's better aggregator, better held together, uh, it's got better structure, so they'll materially stay intact. What we're looking for is those little zones in the soil profile that collapse and disperse, and by dispersion it means they collapse and, well they can slump, but these are the small fine particles that then go into the soil solution which can block all the pores and can basically shut down a soil. A highly dispersive soil layer can be a few millimetres thick, like a layer of tin almost, if it's of a highly dispersive clay concentration. So, and soil that's fully saturated won't allow more water to go through it. So you're just picking up these little zones and understanding how the soil behaves in these sort of micro layers, or what we call circometric. Circo meaning furrow, metrics, maths, circo in Spanish for furrow, but yeah, circometric kind of management, it's this micro management we need to look at to give us an indication of generally how the landscape works in working with a farmer and understanding how they look at it, uh, and then working out how you move forward. So when we're sowing, uh, soils now we tend to sow dry because we can in relation to use of herbicides and getting you know larger crops in the ground as in more hectares we need to do in a shorter period of time um, what the seasons generally throw at us now and there's been slight changes in that or the expectations of how the season's going to finish we plant dry so when we plant dry it's a good thing because we get a, if you're planting wet and into soil, I know there's benefits there, but I like the fact when we sow dry, we get a fracture pattern that we can control. So in these heavier, dense soils, we do give them a chance to get far better infiltration of moisture to depth. And with that, during the season, the moisture and the nutrients coming back and hopefully getting a, a better fill in spring and growing bigger crops and aren't with less stress, if that means. Well, it does mean, that's exactly what it means. It follows through to the end of the season. But yeah, the fracture pattern is so critical with the time. And some soils shouldn't use a disc in them in the, in the condition that they're in, maybe down the track. And some short soils you can use a disc in, but some you probably shouldn't in relation to the climate, the management, and the actual soil type and the condition it's in, which may be from a lot of sheep over the years or whatever, or someone hasn't managed it well or whatever, I don't know. But we need to take that into consideration. So the fracture pattern and the way we fracture soils now, because we're sowing more dry, I think gives us, has given us a huge lift in production without people realising it. Just those small micro-management changes 
um, have been profound, I think. So when we were looking at this soil now at heat slips, I think it's simple. They would need to go to deal with some of the issues they're facing just another centimetre, and which doesn't sound much, but that's a lot more diesel per hectare. So we, we need to take that into consideration and horsepower and things like that, you know, over the number of times they're putting in a ground across a 40 foot bar. So based on that, is there anything we should be doing next year, two years time, three years time? The hard part is you've got grinding materials in your soil. If you, if you turn it all over, you wouldn't. If you turn it all over, you'd end up with a larger layer of slump material. So you can see in some soil types, you know, if you're there, speed tilling or kelly chaining or whatever like those sort of things it depends how much moisture is in it and what's going on you can either have an amazing result or a negative result that's where you sort of need to pick what you so if we did something like that sorry. yes yeah oh, sorry oh. Go and then i'll ask them on yeah. lime is quite insoluble and if you put out lime i'm not saying necessarily at six five or six centimeters you're going to actually get the change that you need some guys will grow um, in high potassium soils. You can do it. You can't. You know, guys will put lime in furrow, you know, liquids and those sort of things. But then you can get an override of potash if you don't have enough potash. And then you can do what you can do. Looking at how friable the soil is underneath, I know it goes down. spring you'll need zinc like diesel in a ute but if you have a your soils here if you've got a wet year and got enough moisture in here you won't but people say oh it's zinc deficient or so they don't understand inefficiency because when it's dry you won't run enough depends what your ph your soil is and those, all the herbicide chemistry you've used but you we do need to swap some of those nutrients based on the season we have but we tend to look at the soil analysis and make these decisions and think it's going to correct itself but a seasonal change of demands. Thanks to Michael and the he slips for showing us around there. Certainly plenty to think about. We move on now to Sean Mason from Agronomy Solutions, who's going to give us an overview of soil mapping techniques. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Brad. Um, yeah, very quick uh, snapshot into some soil data management and mapping, um, just what we've been working through, particularly some of you probably recognize some of the work with Trengo Consulting and Phosphorus, but um, yeah, very good concepts in terms of getting the most out of our soil sampling programs. Um, so just, this is a table of my thoughts and happy to be um, heard otherwise, uh, but effectively looking at some data layers and, and what we can achieve. Some of these are cheap and free um, with some pretty handy interpretation when we start using them in combination, um, but I guess all these top five Google Earth NDVI granule mats, protein EM38 are all leading to hopefully um, a really good pre-season soil sampling program. Um, here Michael talking about, um, the growers talking about plant sampling, also taking samples at, at the representative zones. 
um, and in season um, soil sampling as well is included in that. So I was just going to quickly walk through um, each of these as an example um, with the mid north focus, hopefully. Um, just starting with Google Earth, it amazes me how much information I can get from simply Google Earth. Um, this is probably a mid north near Hart. Um, very typical of the mid north. Um, you'll see those. Grey calcareous patches, uh, bare earth on the left, uh, moving to sort of in season, Google Earth captures are handy as well. So you can see the difference in growth uh, matching the, the, the grey patches in those soils or in that paddock, uh, looking at the triangle paddock in particular. Um, but yeah, you can go back in, in time um, with Google Earth and, and just see, get some different captures um, along the way. So also good for soil amelioration to see how that has done. Um, and practices that you may have changed. But in this case, um, we were actually chasing a phosphorus response trial um, site. So we did some quite intensive sampling. Um, and this is just an example of setting up, potentially using Google Earth and then probing and setting up some management zones. So um, just go back there. There's a, the gray patch there is um, pH 7.8, um, classic example of presence of calcium carbonate. Um, the other highlighted grey patch there, 7.8 again, very well buffered soil. Um, and then just moving into that slightly greener, more productive areas, we've gone back to neutral. So a soil type change in just that spatial um, movement south. And these two very good production um, darker soil patches are back into the slightly acidic. Um, talking about acid throttles, it might actually be good to have a little stratification for six is no problem. Um, these are zero to 10. So again, we've got um, three zones there, particularly of different pH and potentially um, different warrants, different management. So um, Google Earth, very powerful for setting up soil sampling programs. Um, NDVI is another one. Um, there are free platforms with, I think, spatial resolution that is handy enough. Uh, this is, and we're talking about interesting discussion with lentils and wheat and pH um, sensitivity. So this is a paddock where Brian Hughes, who we hear from later, has set up a line trial. So no guessing that there is acidity in this paddock, but where it actually pops its head up um, with, with lentils and corresponding wheat was interesting. So this is using Google Earth and NDVI together. The Google Earth image we can see, um, hopefully you can see the, the southern portion central is a really Nice productive red loam, um, also occurs around the eastern side of that paddock. Um, and amongst that, we've got this gray um, bare earth image popping up on Google Earth. And when you do some probes, uh, Brian's put his line trial in a soil pH, and this is zero to 10. So imagine the stratification there, 4.2 in calcium chloride. Um, but then also in the same paddock, you've got pHs um, that have actually managed to buffer the agricultural practices and um, calcium carbonate present, we're greater than seven. So matching this with NDVI, not just one year, but across crop rotations can be quite powerful in, in, this we haven't, in case we haven't put a soil probe in this paddock. So just wanted to highlight, hopefully that black circle indicates the lentils doing pretty ordinary on that red uh, acidic ground to the east. Um, the wheat, correspondingly the year before down below, um, doing okay, so proportionally doing okay. So we know wheats um, can manage soil acidity a lot better than our pulses and in particular lentils. So just matching those two crop rotation is, is giving us a pretty good indication of what's going on in this paddock and where we may need to ameliorate. Um, also that central part, that really red um, bit down the southern portion of the paddock was popping up. Lentils was doing pretty ordinary um, and the wheat was doing okay. Sorry, I'll just go back one. Um, the proportionate wheat section. So just ignore that dark red bit because that's Brian Hughes's uh, lovely line trial, which is providing really good information. Um, so this is Central York's, but also popping up at Malalar and other places around the Mid-North. Uh, just moving to a grain yield map. So we've gone Google Earth, NDVI. How does that line up with grain yield maps? This is just an example I've pulled from the Mallee again. Sorry, not Mid-North, but... Um, a pretty good example of what we're getting these days with grain yield recordings across the mat. And you can see, uh, sorry, across the paddock, you can see the variability very quickly popping up there. So um, if I had time and money, my uh, idea of actually sampling um, or where to soil sample or create zoning 
Um, sampling would be, okay, high production uh, area there. Um, spot one, we've got an intermediate zone um, down. Uh, this is sort of a flatter part. So one corresponds to a quite a um, sort of a lighter country um, this year. So hanging on to water and we've got unproductive areas. So three, um, fours back into good, good country. Good to compare that with one to see the characteristics driving that production. Um, and again, five, we've got a consistently poor um, area in this paddock going back on previous years. So um, we can start getting a bit crazy and get generating uh, more zones than, than we need. But um, as, as a start, that's a pretty good indicator of, of what we can get in terms of information of what's driving grain yield. These, this pattern actually matched NDVI as well. So we can get a um, time series uh, combination of grain yield and NDVI. Importantly, for nutrition consequences, um, talking about replacement nutrition programs um, and where they may be applicable. So this is just a grain, um, sorry, nutrient removal per in terms of kilograms per tonne of grain. Um, and sorry, I should have said the grain colours are, are getting up to two tonnes per hectare. The red colours are down to below half a tonne. So you start looking at removals across this paddock as an example. Um, up to two tonne, we're getting up to 45 kilos of N removed off our paddock, up to six kilos of P. The underperforming areas, um, less than 10, and possibly some nutrient accumulation. But again, for me, anything that's um, not performing, whether it's NDVI or grain yield, it's it's um, sort of uh, rings a bell that I need to go out there, put a probe in and understand why. Um, can we fix it? Is it going to be economical to fix or is it a underlying um, soil constraint that's going to cost too much to, to feed. Uh, this is probably the next progression. So we've, we've been getting looking at yield maps um, for a while now. Um, and I guess the beauty of our new headers running around is that we can start getting um, protein maps and lining them up with either grain yield um, maps and or um, intensive grid sampling um, as an example here. So. Uh, acknowledgement to Ed Scott, who uh, did a really good presentation at the GRDC updates um, last year. And this is uh, an example of a paddock in New South Wales, so not local, but um, very applicable. That, yeah, they've essentially matched the wheat um, 2019 protein map on your left there um, with deep soil cores of soil mineral ends. So quite intensive sampling, but I guess we can see pretty well emerging some patterns of uh, high protein, um, high soil profile N on the left hand top left of the paddock and particularly on the bottom right of the paddock you've got matching low protein and low soil profile N. So when you start matching up performance of a grain yield map, okay we might have a constraint on the top left that's actually accumulating nitrogen in the soil and in the grain so it might be some yield limitation that we're not aware of. Um, Conversely, are we feeding enough in that bottom section where we've got lower protein but lower profile ends? So that's the spatial distribution and, and things we um, are really, well, where the research is going and where we can get um, improved nitrogen use efficiency. My next comment would be probably to, um, sorry, I've skipped one. Uh, don't forget to yield maps in combination with protein maps. So um, start talking about end banking. It's been quite popular in, um, in terms of research. Uh, but actually looking at new nitrogen removals off your paddock, we can match yields with protein and we can actually get a nitrogen removal rate um, uh, per kilograms per hectare. So we can actually, yeah, again, work out what's our nitrogen balances. But um, again, whereas a um, poor performing parts so that might be accumulating nitrogen, not getting that nitrogen use efficiency and where we are getting the nitrogen use efficiency that warrants feeding. Another, again, stealing from Petra Law, um, this was a really nice example of um, a paddock central Yorks, but um, Pete's uh, running around EM38, uh, just looking at a paddock variability in terms of conductivity. So uh, essentially there's more detail to this, but um, for this talk, essentially low conductivity of labelled sands. So in the red there, moving up to higher conductivity, so it can be, um, Soils with a greater texture, so clays, um, but also constraints uh, can lead to a, a better conductivity rating. So Pete has, in this paddock, segregated his uh, into seven zones um, and looked at basically plant available water and the interaction with um, finishing seasons. So 
the left hand graph there is barley and way back in 2003 but it's a really good example we've got um a nice 45 meal in october it's finished off the barley quite well and the high um texture soils sorry the lighter texture soil clays um has actually been quite producive quite uh, good production um compared to your sands you flip that to 2004 where the season has crashed in October, pretty key time for canola. And of course, a lot of sandy soils have, have held on with um, greater water availability and the heavier soils have crashed. So um, zoning your paddocks and I guess going back to soil sampling, but um, yeah, identifying plant available water and yield potentials across season is, is the next layer. Uh, so just to finish off, I thought I'd put this in perspective for what we've been doing um, with Sam Trengove and, and his crew. Um, this is an example of a paddock where um, this work in, was initiated. Uh, so this is again coming back to a mid north side Google Earth image in season. Uh, the four blue dots there are identification of different uh, matching soil pH. So Sam's run around with his various machine um, and indicated and that's the soil pH map on the right there. Um, and we've got blue alkaline patches coinciding with those gray patches again, as I've discussed, carbonate present. And the red um, is acidic layer, so something to, to look at in terms of uh, liming. But um, what Sam I did identify was that the pH was was related to early in-season NDVI for cereals. So um, not what you possibly expect, but the alkaline patches, the grey patches jutting out um, there had corresponding poor NDVI. So um, and a, a will alarm bell to, to actually go in with a probe and, and, and see what was what was going on. Um, and it turned out to be a, a really nice phosphorus example. So I just thought I'd use this as an uh, example of uh, possibly a transect and hopefully that, that sampling program is dead. Um, but if we were to do an old gate to gate, so one, two, three, four in white, um, conveniently corner of the paddock to another corner of the paddock, merge those soil samples, what's the impact of that in terms of spatial variability on our paddock? Uh, we may also go to the choose the other gate um, on the northern part. Um, what's, the, what's the effect on, on our soil test interpretation and sampling program? You'll notice that the first transect will capture a mixture of uh, the acidic and alkaline. I'll probably give you a, quite a nice neutral pH. Um, the other transect up to that northern part of the gate is pre predominantly acidic country. So we're going to get a very different um, interpretation of where we put our transect. So hopefully the spatial zoning sampling will um yeah it has been an absolute winner for for particularly the phosphorus management uh with sam's work and as an example there's post um partial gross margin data behind this that i haven't um, gone into with time but just an example of choosing those specific zones in those soil types we've got one and two um identified as carbonate soils low um, cobalt p and dgt which is driven by the high PBI, so higher fixing ability of those soil types across a uniform um, previous application of P. By identifying those P deficiencies and correcting them, we've got winds of $70 per hectare in that season, um, where we've got zones three and four, which are back to neutral and slightly acidic, where our P reserves are really, really good. So um, we can actually go back to, to well, I guess, replacement. Um, and if we're in sort of shorter budgets, we might be able to even cut back further than that. The transect uh, by merging all those zones has actually come back to neutral, but we've sort of diluted out that P deficiency zones where we've actually got coal P's at 39, which um, should not be responsive and DGC sort of matches that up. So we do miss that those patches of, of poor NDVI. So don't just throw your hands up and say, we won't feed them. Um, really good uh, indication of or um, message of actually identifying what's driving our um, different crop performance. Uh, this is just another example uh, of further north. Um, Sam's extended this work right up to Bullaroo. Um, this was near Crystal Brook, um, Bali, um, looking at zones. So again, Google Earth, Bare Earth, um, picking up calcareous patches and looking at uh, site A is that uh, photo at the top with a nice P response. And um, the photo on the bottom right is corresponding to the site D24, um, which is in the better NDVI zone um just in terms of gross margins this is spatial variability across the paddock um really good to two ton increase we, i guess we're not going out with nil p but um, when you compare against the nil p we increase it to two tons per hectare which is obviously three to hundred dollars a hectare in this 
season with pretty good grain price. Um, yeah, corresponding section halfway up the paddock to the north, we're not getting an increase um, of yield with increasing P, basically due to that really good inherent um, P application and all that soil allowing for that fertilizer efficiency to maintain a really good soil P bank. And just, I guess, the last comment, um, I know Ben's online, so it'd be good to get his comments. So there are obviously grid sampling um, practices out there that allows for, I guess, high spatial information. Um, does come a bit of a cost because we're getting so many samples and does reduce your soil test package. So that's why I sort of put a pro and con there. Um, really good spatial information. That liming example that Michael was talking about is a really good indicator of grid sampling and what we can do with precision liming. Um, we get cation data for cons. I guess there's no usually PBI um, included in that. The PBI is really important to determine um, P levels, uh, no constraints because the surface and no N. Um, by setting up those zones and, and grids can actually help with zonal setups for the corresponding price, we could possibly do five zones by four depths um, or 10 zones by two depths. And that includes a full soil characterization, which will obviously give you information on profile in, plant available water constraints and um, all other nutrients. So I guess the cons are, the, does that allow for enough spatial um, information across, across these highly variable paddocks? So, um, and I guess one message uh, would be that potentially focusing um, grid sampling on inherent soil properties, um, pH, uh, sorry, so something like a phosphorus buffering index or fixation will actually inform um, where to actually put or develop your zonal placement. So we can actually go in and say, pay, perhaps select three or four zones, even five zones and go back year on year and look at our, our management um, and what we're doing and anything that's changing and what that has impacted on our, for example, phosphorus uh, levels. So uh, just a quick comment there, um, but that's probably enough for me. Thanks, Brad. Um, hopefully that's captured some useful information. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate uh, plenty of information uh, in that presentation. All right, let's head to our next speaker, uh, Brian Hughes from Persa, who's going to run through considerations for soil health in the Mid-North. Yeah, well, welcome today. So this talk will be uh, on considerations for soil health, particularly for the uh, linking it into the Mid-North. Um, some of the information here, I should say, is actually from Amanda Chappell and, and Andrew Harding, as well as myself. Um, and I... I suppose it's following on a little bit from a lot of interest in, in soil health and how we can improve um, soil health. Basically looking at, you know, when you think about soil health, you, you're thinking about the, the physical, the chemical, the biological components of that, um, as well as the, um, in, a, in our situation, that there's there's a, there's a lot of natural induced sort of limitations on certain soil types. And I'll be talking about it more from an agricultural viewpoint. So really looking at uh, soil health in terms of, you know, optimising your production, um, carbon, carbon capture, I suppose, fits into that a little bit, and, and water and nutrient movement, which is very important for agricultural use. The webinar will roughly follow a little bit on, on defining soil health, a bit on the uh, mid-north limitations by soil type, um, and some of the testing that you can do for that, and, and a little bit on carbon, and, and I, I probably an introduction to some of these aspects, not too much detail on, on them in that sense. When you're looking at soil health, I suppose it's a the, the capacity of the soil to function as a living system in relation to its natural capacity. So in terms of the you know healthy soil, you, you want it to be profitable from an agricultural viewpoint, resilient for things like you know drought years and overcoming issues, but you also want it to be biologically productive so, so that the benefits of the bi biological aspects can uh, cover as well and also look, look at environmental quality of the soil as well. It often has an environmental quality. And you want to make sure, I suppose, that a healthy soil, there's, there's not other negative aspects. So you want, you want the impact to be positive in terms of plant, animal and human health as well. Uh, there's no real universal soil health benchmarks. And, you know, what, as I mentioned, what's defined as healthy for an agricultural system is quite different to what's, what it is in, in a natural ecosystem as such. Um, the five key functions that a soil provides, so things like uh, plant productivity, uh, absorbing, you know, CO2 from the atmosphere, Water circulation, so so the water holding capacity of the soil and water and, uh, and nutrient cycling uh, through those soils and plants being able to get hold of those. Uh, the soil provides an energy source for biological organisms uh, and the uh, benefits of, the, of, I suppose, most of the soil biological activities are on, on soil, terms of soil structure. Uh, and I suppose the, the, the last one is really 
one of the new ones is you know can soil be used as a greenhouse gas mitigation um we know that a lot of a lot of the co2 gets lost back into the atmosphere when plants grow but the but you know can we store more carbon in in that soil as well you know generally speaking you, you can sort of split soil into different sized particles so so things like uh, gravel um, sand you can actually see sand when you get down to silt and clay that they're actually invisible size particles and they're down into mic microns and so each bit of soil is made up of these, I suppose, relative soil particle sizes. Uh, and the other aspects that you see um, are um, organic matter, air, water, and I suppose lime, which, which is common in parts of the Mid-North, more common perhaps on York Peninsula. Soil is you know, a precious resource. And they took about you know, 100 years to create a centimetre of soil, uh, probably longer in South Australia. So some of the aspects we about knowing your soil, um, understanding, I suppose, that, that, that I suppose that there's some stuff that you can actually describe yourself and, and assess yourself, or there's stuff that you can assess against benchmarks. And, you know, knowing the, the texture, the colour of the soil, um, the depth of different soil layers is very important in South Australia. Understanding the, the pH or the fill pH as you go down through that profile, um, whether acidity or alkalinity is an issue of certain layers. And then looking at the you know that what how deep are the roots growing down there? Are they restricted uh, restricted because of a certain layer in the soil type? And identifying some of the constraints which might cause that. So limitations for, for mid north soils you know, that we often see are you know hard setting surface soils in some cases. The, a lot of our soils have nice sandy loam, sandy clay loam textures which can set quite hard, particularly if organic matter gets reduced. Uh, they can have sodic or what we call dispersive layers underneath it particularly linked to clays and often the wet areas and paddocks often often have a, a, a clay underneath which holds the water up um shallow soil shallow over, over calcrete or, or rock um there are certainly calcareous soils which can be quite alkaline throughout the profile um the ph uh, things like acidity is a, is a major issue that we've seen develop through the the uh, the non-calcareous soils in the mid-north uh, subsoil constraints that have been around for a long time, but that's certainly things like boron, uh, salt, uh, are certainly there and, and still present. And and I suppose in this, the sandy areas which do occur in the mid-north, which are a bit more isolated, you know, things like water repellent, see on those. Generally speaking, if we look at some of the sandy loam to loam to over clay soils, and, and you know, this is probably, you know, 60% of the area I've, I've lumped into these. <laughs> yeah, certainly surface issues can be an issue. Uh, sandy loam to clay loam in the surface, Sometimes the poorly structured clays, not always. Um, sometimes the clays can be quite well structured. Um, and again, we sometimes see sub, subsoil issues, things boron, high salt, and suddenly as you go down. Um, most of these these sandy loam to, to loam and soils now, we are seeing issues with acidity, particularly in that top layer above the clay. Uh, so so that, that layer has acidified over time. Calcareous loam to clay loam, you know, again, very common through the mid north, can sometimes be in combination with the redder soils, but you know, loam to clay lime surface soils, alkalines throughout, um, can get a bit clay as you go down through them or you go through a lime layer of some description as well. And, and I suppose the, the heart filled day site is the, the photograph here on the on the left hand side, um, at 42 centimeters in that soil, you know, that becomes an issue with things like subsoil boron, high, high pH and high ESP. And the, and the salt, the subsoil salt starts increasing, even though the the top forty two centimeters is actually really good. <laughs> as, as you go down through that, there are some of those subsoil issues, and and they become more of an issue where the the rainfall reduces down. Most of those those calcareous soils have some type of calcareous layer on them, and just roughly these these are the the calcareous layers from Mashman that really developed from Ken Weatherby's work. Um, you know, class one is is the fine carbonate in clay. Uh, that you often see, it can often be associated with poor drainage and, and root growth as you go down. Um, class two is what we call the laminar sheet or boulder calcrete, which, depending how continuous it is, can restrict root growth in its own right. If, if it's got a few fractures and things, it, it will restrict drainage as well. Um, class three, A, B, and C are all, I suppose, um, uh, layers of, of carbonate with, with uh, increasing amounts of of uh, carbonate fragments through them um, in a sort of a uh, uh, loamy sand to sort of light clay type matrix. Um, 
you'll actually find often with the 3B and 3C, where it's you know 30 to 60 or 60 percent, the roots will actually grow quite nicely in the broken uh, fragments of, of lime uh, cowcrete. And then underneath that, you can sometimes have, have issues with, with the sort of um, drainage, depending on how, how, uh, how heavy the soil is. And a class four, we don't really see much of in the mid-north, which is really more linked to fine, deep sands. And certainly there's, you know, there's minor sand and sand over clay areas in, in the mid-north area um, around the rivers, around the like river, um, around Pinery and those sort of places and Avon. Um, and those those sandy soils have, you know, surface water repellents. Some, sometimes the structure, the clay can be poorly structured underneath uh, and and subsoil constraints can be an issue with them. The, where you've got a deeper sands, you know, you, the, and possibly the development of, of hard pans in that sort of 20 to 40 centimetre layer and things like like deep ripping or, or um, inclusion plate ripping may have a, have a place for those. Um, also have seen a silvication of these soil types, um, particularly where they haven't got any natural lime in them as as uh, the Sydney sort of spreads to some of the, the lower medium rainfall districts. Now I'll just put this one in as a, you know, that there also are a, a bit of red and black cracking clays, um, particularly in the, in the, I suppose, the lower north, um, but patches of it further north. Um, and these are fertile sort of heavy soils. Can be difficult if they're too wet or dry. Often can be quite high yielding in the right year. Uh, and and uh, interesting, these are often seen as you know, possible sinks for carbon that should be able to increase the carbon content. So some of the issues I've talked about, um, you know, high and low pH. So as you become really acid, you can see, see in Trog's um, graph, I suppose, a number of the nutrients become much more or less available. Things like molybdenum is a deficiency is the one we commonly see, but you know, magnesium, calcium, uh, potassium, phosphorus will become less as the soil becomes more acid. As it becomes strongly alkaline on the other end, um, we we're actually seeing, the, I suppose, the uh, things like iron, manganese, copper and zinc all become much less available and they're often tied up as carbonate forms. Um, and, you know, we, we can see in some cases in the same paddock, you know, pHs of the surface go from, say, four and a half to, to nine. Another example is just a, a shot showing boron toxicity in barley in a, in a wheat trial with a rye barley and, and that yellow patterns, I suppose, on the leaves in the barley. Um, when I talk about dispersive or sodic clays, I'm talking about these clays uh, where, where the, the the clay starts to fall apart and you get this sort of milky halo around the clay particles when they've dropped in uh, distilled water, rainwater, right through to you know, highly dispersive where you get this sort of milk pattern right through. And, and that's what happens in reality too with the dispersive clay, that fine material comes out and clogs up all the pores. This did put in a lime response from wherever, uh, and this is showing you know quite a big lime response in beans. You know, really, you, you've got to understand the limitations you've got, overcome them if, if it's sort of an economic way of doing that, I suppose. And then you're looking at improving carbon and microbial activity. You know, going back a step, you know, what makes a, a healthy functioning soil? You know, there's a, there's a range of sort of uh, chemical aspects of that. So there's, uh, there's the, the uh, nutrients for plants, the right pH, low levels of toxicity. Some of these you can fix, some you can't. <laughs> and a good cation exchange. Uh, the, the physical aspects um, in terms of, you know, is the soil got stable structural peds? Is water and air able to move through the soil? You know, do roots have good access and can they move through? Um, and then the biological aspects, which are really about, you know, is there enough good food supply there to get, get a sort of diverse and functional sort of biological activity happening and presence, populations present? You know, have you got those bugs there, the suppressed diseases and things like that. You know, so so in terms of one of the things you can look at, you know, productivity, food and fibre. You know, so are we optimising production of food and fibre? And this is one of the things linked to the, I suppose, the uh, yeah, soil health and a good soil health. You know, are we are we at good levels of biomass, um, yield, dry matter, NDFI, DVBI, fractional cover, those types of assessments. Have we got good, good livestock numbers on the property? Um, can we improve those? We can just test them against things like your potential models. Uh, how are we going against the French short or, or absent type models that are around? First one is, you know, optimising that production of food and fibre. Second one is really looking at water infiltration and storage. Um, so can we improve the soil structure, get better infiltration and, and storage of water? And you can assess your soil visually for this one initially and just have a look at it, you know, as it got 
in terms of the structure, are there, I suppose, nice stable pits? Are they you know, a nice little pea size shape? Normally well, means it's pretty good for root growth, or are they coming out in big blocks, um, and big lumps of concrete? Um, and, and that's telling you there's a structural problem there. Can the water infiltrate properly? Uh, you can do a little test, like using infiltration rings and measure how quickly water goes into the soil. Uh, that's a good comparative test, um, and it provides information on pore sizes as well. Um, the third way people tend to assess soil structure is, is the strength and density. Um, so the, the bottom one down here is really looking at a bulk density ring. So they're, they're measuring how, how much soil was actually in that in a certain volume. So the heavier the soil in that volume, um, the more dense the soil is. And once you get over a certain lim limit, I suppose, you've got restrictions on whether roots can push through it, the pores in those soils. Um, and on sandy soils, I suppose, we, we also look at things like penetrometer readings. Just an example here of, of really using a penetrometer down a profile. You know, once it gets over 2,500, you know, you, you, you'll you have restricted root growth due to a hard pan in that case. Um, and I've just put an example of a, a response there from Butte, from San Tringo's work, just looking at, um, you know, deep ripping, inclusion ripping and spading over a control in that set situation. So soil organism or bi biological activity. So understanding and, and target improvement of the of the diversity is one of the aims of that. And, and, I, and I suppose becoming much more popular, but it can be quite difficult to, to know which test and how you actually measure that test. Um, the visual assessment of, of, of that, you, there are sort of simple tests you can do from putting out you know, cotton strips to toilet roll holders to to undies in the soil and seeing how quickly they they rot down and comparing them across different situations to as a measure of how biologically active your soil is. There's um, um, sort of si simpler sort of tests that are around um, and which often relate to the amount of food source. So there are certain things like biological activity um, and, and they measure the CO2 produced from that uh, or there's more specialised measures when they're looking at... Um, carbon nitrogen ratio of microbes, um, abundance of and, or grouping of species and functional groups, and, and a lot of work being done on, on DNA assessment of those groups, either for disease or for, for looking at um, healthy biological groups, such as you know, healthy nematodes in the soil. So in terms of, the, the I suppose, in the next area I want to talk about was nutrient cycling again. So this is the traditional way that people have tended to look at soil. So they've looked at um, you know, soil testing and your aim is improved nutrient cycling in the amount available to plants, but and plant and sap tests are certainly in there. There's a lot, lot of work being done on developing plant tests um, and, a, and a lot of interest in things like sap testing, I suppose, um, but particularly good for picking up, you know, things like tracement deficiencies and comparative testing of, of um, plants. Um, the soil testing you know, has been quite widely used and things like, you know, pH, organic matter, um, major nutrients are all pretty good, pretty well documented. Um, things like phosphorus, the coal or phosphorus test um, has been widely used. The, the DGT phosphorus is a new test that's so really suited to calcareous soils in particular uh, and and a much better test for those. Uh, it measures the, the available phosphorus in that year. So well, coal P probably picks up more of the stuff that's already tied up. Um, exchange with cations gives us an overall measure of how fertile it is. Um, trace element testing, the plant testing is probably better for trace elements, but it, it gives you a bit of a feel for things like copper, zinc, manganese, and iron. Um, things like aluminium, which is a toxicity level, and boron, sodium, and chloride are, are all picked up quite well in, in um, testing. Soil testing, often if you test down the profile, you'll see some of those with our issues in the, in the, in the profile. And a little bit on greenhouse gas mitigation and, and um, the aim, again, you know, can we increase soil organic carbon and, the, and you know, can your soil become a store for that? And, and unfortunately, it's one of those things which, um, you know, we, we can have a really active soil organic carbon. It can often be breaking down, uh, improving the functions of the soil. Um, so you have a lot of soil biology there, which sort of decomposes uh, lots, lots of nutrient sightings and water availability. But for greenhouse gas, we actually want to store it <laughs> and, and get it into more active and stable fractions of the of the uh, um, organic carbon fraction. So you've sort of got these two things going at once. You can have a really active soil biology without improving the carbon 
or you know, can we store some of that, which has got you know, wider implications. Um, some of the work that Amanda Shea Pearls put together is looking at the old soil testing data from 1990 to 2007. And this is really interesting in the sense that we've seen an increase uh, across um, most of the pasture soils assessed through that time. You can, that's the green line. And the cropping soils, which is the blue line, there's a slight increase as well. So, so during that period, just looking at all the soil testing that you get a hands on, you know, we've, we've seen a slight increase in terms of carbon, in, in terms of cropping, and a, and a larger increase in terms of the yeah, the pasture soils. Um, and that's probably you know good news to know that we've, we've improved slightly. We don't really know what's happened since then. You know, have we reached a new equilibrium? Our soils functioning and producing more. And you know, since those uh, early two thousands, when you know no tills come in in a big way as well, we've seen a lot of stubble retention and reduced cultivation. And through that project, she was able to really benchmark uh, organic carbon. And this is figures for the for the mid north, um, and you'll see that there's a, a texture uh, qualifier in there. So loamy sand, sandy loam, loam through to clay. This is all based on naught to ten uh, soil test data, and the organic carbon test used was the Walkley Black test. Um, and when you're at the, you know, twenty five percent, it basically means if you're at this level or below, you're you're at the the twenty five percent highest level, I suppose, um, for that. So you're actually quite a low level. You're in the in the bottom quarter of the uh, of the data as you go, say seventy five percent above, you're actually in the in the in the top quarter. So so if you're already up at seventy five percent or more, you, you're probably getting to that stage where you you're wondering, you know, can you go much higher? Of you've reached some sort of equilibrium there. If you're down the, the bottom end, it you, you, you probably tells you that there's potential to improve it quite a bit. And just to finish off, you know, so the opportunity to increase soil carbon, organic carbon is really dependent on where you where you are in terms of starting point, the capacity to store organic carbon, the texture and uh, soil constraints to the inputs, um, rainfall, moisture and temperature, um, which you know, affects the growth and the outputs and, the, and I suppose the decomposition composition of the microbial activity, the ability to grow or, or apply sufficient organic carbon inputs, and the, the um, supply of sufficient nutrition to grow the biomass enable its transformation to those longer term storage areas. So, so enable it to transfer into particular organic carbon or humus organic carbon, which will last a lot longer. And I suppose the, you know, we've seen some work from Cesar Ocean Park Kirby where you, you, know, you need to have enough nutrient there to enable that to happen if you wanted to go into those longer term forms. Um, so generally, yeah, improving soil health, just to summarise it all, um, you know, what, improving plant growth and managing limitations is certainly part of it. Understanding the starting point and where you're at in terms of the capacity to improve. Um, certainly, you know, improving soil by adding amendments, things like clay on water kind of sand or putting lime out there has, has the ability to make a major change through the profile. The biological activity can be improved by adding organic material, whether it's you know compost, stubble, biochar, various things. And and the other one, which I think has been a, a major thing, is, is looking at the no-till or reduced tillage uh, has had a major impact on it. Thanks, Brian. Uh, a lot to think about there when it comes to soil health. We'll keep moving. Uh, on to Ben Flay from Precision Agriculture, who's going to take us through some subsurface subsurface acidity research. Uh, they've done in the mid north uh, with funding from Saget. Welcome, Ben. Hey there, Brad. How are you going today? Okay, thanks very much, everyone, for, for having us today. So, um, this is a, just a brief summary of a project we conducted um, with the mid north high rainfall zone group, of course. And as Brad mentioned, obviously, which was funded by Saget in 21 22 season. So, I guess, in essence, um, for the audience here, so I'm sure um, everyone's well aware of the prevalence of soil pH across. Across the state, um, certainly, you know, we've uh, we've collected lots of soil over the years across South Australia, and constantly find lots of variation, particularly in the top ten centimeters. I guess there's been lots of research done elsewhere in, in New South Wales and Victoria, where um, there was obviously a lot of variation within the top centimeters as well as below top centimeters. You know, largely because of um, the the shallow sampling was unable to pick up things like stratification acid throttles and subsurface acidity were undetected. So we just, we used this project with the Mid North Rainfall Group to try to work, use some tools to identify what's what's the best, what was the best way, the best approach 
to try and highlight those areas and the prevalence of them. And that was using things like surface pH, soil testing, CEC, EM38, and airborne radiometrics for some targeted strategic soil testing. So there was a series of 18 paddocks across the region, um, all of whom were the Mid-North Rainfall Group members, of course. Mm -hmm. And we grew them into three um, sectors, basically. So, um, so six paddocks each. So paddocks that had been unmapped and hadn't been limed, paddocks that had been pH mapped, either the various or grid sampling, um, but hadn't been limed. And there were ones that had been pH mapped, either grid or various machines. Uh, but had been limed. So they were the three distinct categories. And then we, um, in each of those, we conducted some strategic soil testing to investigate any constraints down the profile. So 0, 5, 5, 10, 10 to 15, and 15 to 27 increments. And as mentioned earlier, then and then look back at the data sets, I guess, to see what relationships there, there were or may have been between things like pH, other properties, the EM38 and radiometrics. In terms of some of the observations we saw, so I guess, you know, um, unsurprisingly, in three quarters of the, of the of the samples, basically, and most of the paddocks we saw tested, um, you know, anything, you know, everything between five and 20 centimetres was acidic. So we saw the acidity um, often creep up, and you can see in those three charts below there, the A, B, and C, the first one being the unmapped, unlimed, the second one being um, the mapped but not limed or limed um, outside of 12 months and see the ones that were mapped and limed. Um, the red the red um, lines on the charts there, you can see are the, are the lighter soil types, so where the cation exchange capacity is between 5 and 10. The green are where, where it's greater than 10. And then on the second two charts on the middle and the right-hand side there, you can see there's a handful of black lines where the CEC the, the, was... Um, greater than 30, so if you'd like the higher clay content, the heavier soil textures in the, in the region. Um, and interestingly, we saw a really pretty strong correlation. Anywhere the CEC was under 20, there was a, was a really good sign um, of um, the likelihood of acidity at depth, whereas in those heavier soil types, the CEC above 30, uh, we often saw it was alkaline and much the same down the profile. So based on the data set we collected, so you can see on that chart here with the, the y-axis of pH and calcium chloride and the x-axis of cation exchange capacity, um, yeah, we found an R-squared, so correlation of over 0.7 um, when you looked at pH and CEC, which sort of indicated to us that the cation exchange capacity, if you like, was a really good indicator of the extent of the pH levels down the profile across the whole project. So, and this here is basically, I think, just a series of charts here looking at, um, once again, at those at the CEC and the different different groupings anyway. So, similarly, you can see it's between 0.6 and 0.8 in the different categories um, of the CEC and the pH. So, once again, that probably gave us the confidence that the, that the data set was pretty consistent across the board outside of those um, higher CEC paddocks. Um, but everywhere else, certainly, the, where the pH... Um, uh, was low, of course, you know, the CEC was low and, and vice versa. We're, we're at, we're, I think as mentioned at the start, we also looked at things like the EM38, which we use ex, um, uh, a lot across the, the, the region, um, as well as some some airborne radiometrics. Um, and so both of those were, were investigated and then lined up to see whether or not they correlated with pH down the profile, so 5 to 10 and 10 to 15 centimetres. And you can see there the correlation was very poor. So the EM was you know, below zero and the and the gamma was only just above zero. So certainly across that sample size of 18 paddocks, um, you know, they, they weren't a good guide for subsurface. Now, remembering it's in the top 20 centimetres and the EM38 is a great tool, but for down the profile, um, to sort of to half metre below, but certainly in the top 20 centimetres, it wasn't a great guide. Whereas you can see there on the on the right hand side, the, the CEC and the um, 
and the pH had a correlation of 0.9, so particularly um, in those in those lighter soil types as well. So I guess in summary, um, our conclusions were, you know, we certainly found there was, you know, based on the data that we gathered through the project, plus the previous data from the, the, the various machine or grid sampling, um, that there was lots of variation across the 18 sites and there was pH ranging from below five to above eight, which is pretty common through the region. Secondly, um, as we dug further down the profile, uh, the acidity at depth between five and 20 was observed in, you know, in all but one site on three quarters of the locations. Um, and even when the pH of the top soil ladder was, was close to neutral, around seven, um, typically, where the where the pH in the in the topsoil was above seven, um, the subsurface acidity was was either negligible or more frequently absent altogether. Um, and in the majority of the sites, you know, the CEC and the soil pH were you know, were strongly correlated with an R squared greater than 0.6. So, so I guess in conclusion, um, you know, of all the tools we tested, we certainly found the CEC assessments of the topsoil was the most accurate guide of, of determining if pH was prevalent at depth or not. Thanks, Brad. That was a, um, yeah, I suppose it's a quick quick run through from our, from our end on that project. Great, thanks, Ben. Uh, yeah, some really interesting uh, research happening there and, and with the uh, SAGET funding too, which is fantastic. Our last presenter of the day is uh, Ollie Magic who's going to take us through some soil sampling. Um, Ollie's been involved with a, a project with GPSA as well, which uh, he'll talk about um, regarding some uh, soil carbon baselining. Over to you, Ollie. Fantastic, thank you, Brad. So, hello, everybody. So, yeah, just um, this is just wanted to briefly introduce um, a project that we work on with GPSA, that there still are a couple of opportunities for people in the, you know, the mid-north to be involved with. So, uh, along with... Uh, GPSA, we are recipients of a project in the National Soil Carbon Innovation Challenge. So that challenge was set up by the federal government off the back of the, um, the fact that at the moment is essentially quite prohibitively expensive for a lot of um, producers in Australia to go and get their farms um, rigorously baselined for, for soil carbon. Um, and that's uh, you know, due to the fact that at present, basically the uh, the initial submission that you do uh, is based purely around physical soil samples. And as a lot of you producers in the Mid-North would know, there is a lot of variability across your farms. And actually, if you want to have real confidence in that baseline that you're basically going to be um, uh, uh, lodging, uh, you need to take a significant number of cores that drives all the cost up. Let's say it's around $20 a hectare. It can be as high as that for small farms at the moment. The federal government said, we want to we want to set this stretch goal of getting it down to $3 a hectare to get people uh, baselined right across Australia. And that's what they want to put in place so that they really, really scale up all farmers having basically ha uh, had their soil carbon storage. Um, so how much carbon they're storing in their top, at least 30 centimetres. Um, that, that's what they're wanting to do to scale this all. Um, so just on the left, that's the current methodology as you look at it, that's physical soil cores. So, um, you know, you could lodge a farm um, under the government ACQ scheme here, our kind of um, uh, federal government carbon program with as few as nine soil cores over a whole farm. So you have quite low level of confidence in that, which is why, you know, typically you would need to take significantly more cores, which is making our work uh, and our project is not trying to do away with physical soil samples. They're extremely important. Um, but what we are trying to do is to demonstrate that if we can build up um, this database of physical soil samples, which are available for innovators and researchers going forwards, that they will be able to use these this sample lab results and use those to help localize basically computer models of soil carbon so but they're always being localized against specific farms so at this point in time 
it is massively challenging for anybody to be able to come onto any of your farms and accurately quantify your soil carbon just using you know imagery from space and other data layers that might exist out there typically you really do need to take samples to have confidence in those results um so we're out there um taking about 20,000 samples across nearly 500 farms in total. Uh, so there is going to end up being approximately 100 farms in South Australia, of which I think we have about 15 to 20 in the Mid-North region at the moment. There is a couple of spaces left. Um, but yeah, putting in place a really big data set that will be available to kind of drive this whole space forwards. Um, just really quickly to step you through the process that we um, go through. And this is just using FarmLab software as an example, um, but just so you see the process, if you were wanting to compliantly baseline your soil carbon so that it was, um, it was compliant with the current uh, 2021 soil carbon methodology. Basically in our tools, what we do when, we, when we're working with a farmer, we, we have the cadastral boundary layer for every state. So in South Australia, we have the cadastral boundary layers of, of every kind of farm property. So we get that from the farmers, we get their lot and DP numbers initially. So that allows us to throw up the cadastral boundary layer. And then from that, we then draw carbon estimation areas. So we draw those um, inside of the land that each farmer owns. Um, typically we either create one or two carbon estimation areas. We create two if that landholder um, wants us to work to pick up um, and sample we show that there is a significant difference between one area of their farm and another area of their farm due to some kind of management practice difference or, or significant change in soil. So we create two CEAs um, and then we use random stratified sampling. So actually just going back to that slide, um, when we generate the sampling zones or strata, we're using, um, you know, Sean was mentioning about like NDVI, that could be a layer that we use to help inform how we just initially create sampling zones, or it could be NDVI, and we would also include something like topographic um, wetness index. So how the water's moving across the, um, the landscape is often a good indicator of where you'll see higher and lower um, regions of soil carbon, and also just working with the farmers themselves and getting their actually ground truth knowledge of their farms and just helping to refine those sampling zones. Uh, then we, sh we share all those sampling points out with the sampling team. So Amanda Chappelle at, um, at Sardi is, who was just on those slides with Brian before, uh, it's Sardi and Perza are one of our soil sampling um, partners here in FA. So they use FarmLab just to go and navigate out to each of those points on a farm um, and accurately navigate uh, we want them to be typically within about a metre of uh, a metre of accuracy. They take those soil samples. Um, we, with our projects, are taking samples um, down at least 30 centimetres, but we're pushing down, um, so our target is 60 centimetres or, or a metre, and what we do, uh, or until we hit any kind of bedrock, uh, we then, when those samples come out, we measure off the top 30 centimetres and then we, uh, and that's kind of the top soil sample. And then we, and then anything from 30 centimetres down makes our subsoil sample. Those go in sampling bags, which the samplers then scan and they disappear off to, uh, in this instance, APAL labs, where they uh, they go through a, a an air drying process over a couple of days, which dries them down before they then get ground and they get all of any kind of rock or root fragments over two mil get kind of sieved out. And then they go through the lab um, steps. There's a specific soil carbon test we have called um, DFI test. Uh, it goes through those steps so that we get the um, data required to be able to calculate the bulk density of those samples. And also that machine on the middle on the right, as you look at it, is a LECO machine. And that is a analyzer that gives us our, our organic carbon percentage. And then we have an API link with those labs. So with APAL labs, once they've, they've processed the, the, the soil samples, they then send the results automatically back to us. And then we make that available to each of the landholders via the interface. 
So, um, and then we're helping to share with each of those farmers that we're sampling, what are their soil carbon percentages? And also we combine that with the bulk density of the sample and the depth that it's got to, to give them actually their stock. So for example, we, we were also a great grower in McLaren Vale. We went and sampled our vineyard in our top 30 centimeters. We have about one and a half percent carbon at the moment and then when that gets calculated to create a stock we have about 50 tons of um, carbon in our top 30 centimeters so we'll we'll create that for you the project it pays for all of the sampling and lab testing um the, the basic is a deal with uh, the federal government and with landowners is that as a part of having all those costs covered those producers agreed to be able to share that data with the federal government to help build up this data set that will power innovation and, and research going forwards. Um, and I'd say, even though we only have a couple of spots left in SA at the moment, our side, I would definitely see that there are going to be a number of opportunities coming up over the coming years for you to be able to get assistance to be able to get baseline baselined. I saw just last week that the um, landscape boards in South Australia have been successful in being um, in winning a big project to do a lot of carbon outreach work um, so that they're delivering really, really good advice out there to land holders. And it's not kind of just advice that's coming from carbon project developers. It's much more neutral. So lots of opportunities coming up. Uh, one of our objectives is to get to a point, you know, in the mid north where we have enough data that when we're when when we're sampling any farms, we're able to show where that farm sits against the mean of just that region. So when we look at the soil carbon stocks of each farm across the, across the region, where do you sit against the mean? Um, also starting to share kind of some data that we get access to from CSIRO around what is likely to happen also to your climate going forward. And that's, we're doing a load of farms up near the Goida line that uh, yeah, are potentially in that transition away from just being very much cropping focused to being cropping and livestock or or moving more predominantly to kind of being livestock based and even producing energy as a part of that as well. So yeah, we're using our project to assist as many producers as we can along this journey. So yeah, please, there's only a few spots left. So um, if if you there is a waiting list as well but if you get a moment please just pop on to getfarmlab.com forward slash carbon it takes just a couple of minutes to register we do need your lot a lot and dp number from you so we know actually um where your land title is uh, but we're trying to make it as simple as we can and we are out there sampling um and really really focusing on cropping ahead of ahead of seeding so it would be great to uh, work with a number of you thank you and thank you brad for all your support at gpsa Great, thanks, Ollie. Um, any questions? Well, we, we've run out of time, so we'll take any questions on notice and uh, and make sure we get back to you. So in, in summary, uh, we've reached the end of the webinar. Um, so can you please join me in thanking our presenters today? Michael Ayres, Sean Mason, Brian Hughes, Ben Flay and Ollie Madgett. I'd also like to thank Northern and York Landscape Board for funding this webinar through its grassroots grants program. And on behalf of GPSA, I'd also like to thank you all for joining us. I hope it's been informative for you all uh, and you managed to get the information you're after. Uh, wishing you a safe and happy Christmas. Bye for now.